Hi, hello, and welcome. This is the interview with Chris Watkins, one of the three founders of Bao Couture, an architecture practice in South Australia. This clip was used to put together the full-length documentary Behind Closed Doors, The Life of an Architect. If you're thinking of entering the architecture or interior profession, you've got to see it. That link is going to be up above or in the description below to check that out. But without further ado, let's get on with the interview. Okay, my name is Chris Watkins. I'm one of the three founding directors here, along with uh, David and Mariano. Very cool, and how long have you been in the profession for? Uh, I graduated in 1993, so uh, there's a lot of years there. What's that, 27? 27. 27 years, a long time. Uh, does it feel like 27 years though? No, sometimes it does, sometimes it doesn't, but you know. Mm, yeah, it, it it has gone really quick, man. Like really quick. <laughs> yeah, <right>. scarily quick. <laughs> yeah. So why architecture? What made you want to be an architect? My dad was a builder. As a kid, I've always been, you know, mucking around building sites and making things, and interested in materials and putting things together. And he was always really open in showing me how to and teaching me how to use tools and and stuff. And I guess because I showed an interest in it, it just helped that uh, helped that happen. So I guess construction and that has always been a part of a big part of my life. When I was at school, I didn't really well. I kind of wanted to be an architect. I kind of wanted to be an engineer, but I was also a bit lazy too. So and I, I was playing music at the time, and maybe that was something that I felt that I could I could do when I finished school I didn't choose architecture mainly because it was five years whereas engineering at the time was four years and so I went into engineering which is a big mistake I lasted one year in engineering probably turned up to three lessons three lectures one of those was maths the first maths lesson or first maths, maths lecture I knew that there is no way that I was going to be able to handle this course if this is the mathematics that I had to do. So, you know, that kind of knocked out engineering. Again, I was still a little bit nervous about five years at uni studying architecture. So I then dropped into building technology. I uh, did that for a couple of years. During that course, we did a few lessons with architect students and a few subjects with those guys and I felt that oh, look, I've really got to bite the bullet because this looks great, I'd really enjoy this. So then I hopped over to architecture. Luckily I got a few subjects that were accredited uh, so again it was fairly easy, you know, suited my lifestyle at the time. By the time I got to I think third year architecture, it was the Institute of Technology then, it was just turning into the University of South Australia. They brought in a new uh, professor, Professor Peter Burgess, and the whole school changed. And that's really when I started to understand what architecture is and really start to enjoy it and develop a, not only an understanding but a passion for it, real interest in, in design and, and, uh, and architecture. Yeah, so that's, my, that's how I ended up as an architect. Do you have any hobbies outside of architecture? Do you like what you do outside of the office in your free time? Yeah, look, I try and keep myself active. I've always been an active person. Architecture is still, I mean, it's still a job, but outside of work, I still pursue music. Music's a very big part of my life still. I spend a lot of time, not as much as I would like, but uh, a lot of time in the ocean, surfing and occasional round of golf. I've got two kids as well and they take up a bit of time, quite quite a lot. I was coaching soccer for about uh, seven years there as well, so that took up a bit of time. So yeah, my life's pretty full outside of work and work takes up a lot of time as well. They call it work-life balance. It is a balance, a balancing act, and you really need that, um, that, that activity outside of work I think in order to be productive and meaningful in your work, there's people that I know that just spend all their time in the office doing architecture, which is fine. 
In fact, one of my partners does that, Mariano. That's his, that's his thing. But uh, he obviously really enjoys it. That's what he digs doing. So that's cool. But I'm, I'm, not that, I'm not like that. I need to recharge my batteries outside of work. It, uh, it helps me think and it helps me uh, think clearly about jobs and work and design and issues and so on. Mm. On a scale of 1 to 10, how well did your education prepare you for the profession? I think it prepared me very well for the profession. I would say a 9 or even a 10. A, not, a, not a 10, so let's say a 9, a high 9. Why is that? A lot of people think that the education of an architect is about preparing them for the first year of practice, right? So it's, a, it's like you go to school, you go to uni, and then you start work. It's a very lineal procession of learning. And it is kind of that. But once you graduate from architecture, you come out with this whole big pile of knowledge that you won't get to use on your first day, your first month, or even your first year, or even your first decade of practice. The education of an architect is more about giving you this ball of knowledge that will sit with you for your entire career that you'll dip into and put and constantly pull things out at the appropriate time. You know, so if you hear a graduate saying, oh, I wasn't prepared for this, you know, I, I didn't know about that or I didn't know about that, that's fine. It doesn't, it doesn't matter. That's what your first few years of working are, are for, to teach you those things. And, and some of those things would be impossible to, to teach at university. I mean, architecture is such a massive practice that it would be impossible to compress that into three, four, five year university course and hope to prepare someone for practice in a way that they could be able to, you know, start up their own practice and do architecture, for example. But they can prepare someone for thinking and how you think about problems and your problem solving processes. Now, those are the kind of things that you will take from your education and draw upon and use and refine for your whole career. In my schooling, I had that from my teachers and uh, in particular, Professor Peter Burgess, who uh, maybe I'd benefited more from um, my relationship with him than most students, because uh, back then I was a very, quite a heavy smoker and he was a very heavy smoker. And outside of lectures, he would always come up and bum cigarettes. You know, so he'd say, oh, Chris, have you got a, got a cigarette? And of course, you'd give him a cigarette. And then you'd have two minutes of one-on-one conversation. And inevitably, you'd end up talking about architecture. And then you'd have another one. And, you, you know, it was, it was a lot cheaper than paying fees. It's just, it's just occasional cigarettes. So, you know, I, I think I learned as much, if not more, with those chance meetings with, uh, with, with Peter than I did in formal lectures, you know, so, yeah. If you could describe your university experience in one word or sentence, how would you describe it? Enlightening is, is got to be one of those things. Life-changing, definitely life-changing, unexpected and engaging and interesting you know all of those all of those things i know that i'm privileged to have gone to university and and had had that education but i would go as far as to say almost essential mm. it's been essential for my life a big part of who i am is because i had that experience with those people at that time who would have known what what would have happened but I don't think I would be nearly as content. I don't think I would be nearly as uh, happy or any of those things without that experience. It's a life-changing experience, life-changing. And if you get the chance to do it, then do it. Don't even think about not doing it, you know, or putting it off. That's the other thing, don't put it off, just do it. You rarely meet someone that regrets having a tertiary education. Uh, you meet plenty of people that regret not having one, so you know that the kind of decisions already made for you. Yeah. So to start your day as an architect, do you have any special morning rituals or routines that you do 
whether it be as soon as you wake up or as soon as you get to the office. Yeah, yeah, coffee has a big um, plays a big part of that. I think that's pretty common. I try to when I first get up or when I first wake up. Um, grab a coffee, you know, take the dog out, feed the dog, you know, wake the kids up. Uh, and then I've got about half an hour to an hour every morning and I try to get through my emails to try and clear the decks of all the crap. I usually get into work a bit late, like 9.30, 9, 9.30, but I've at least cleared the decks so I can have a meaningful discussion with my colleagues about the day's work ahead, any issues that they may have or any meetings that we need to prepare for, presentations or so on. And that's really only a recent thing that I've, I've started to do is to try and, you know, start work with a clear slate. I find that that really helps you have some clarity in the morning. I've started riding in as well, riding my bike into work, which also clears your head a little bit. It puts you in, the, in a, into a frame of mind where you can start to think about the day ahead and what you want to achieve that day or what the issues are going to be and if you have any serious issues you've got a bit of time to just think through them before you actually get into the into the office as soon as you get into the office it's really difficult to focus sometimes although we are a small office you may have a lot of people asking you questions and you so you can get dis distracted really easily that distraction takes you away from trying to find that clarity and thinking so I try and do it as much as I can before I get into the office and then the office is just work and then after the office you can start that clarity of thought again that's why it's important to get outside you know that's why it's important to get out as well yeah so yeah coffee <laughs> During the day, what takes up most of your time and what do you spend most of your time on? It varies a lot, but if you go through, which I've done recently, if you go through my timesheets, it's probably my average week would be 30% business stuff, 30% project work, and 30% trying to get more project work so submissions and business development and strategizing of you know how we're going to get the next job that kind of stuff talking about what we've heard uh, that kind of varies some days it's all strategizing sometimes it's all project work and sometimes it's all running the practice but it's generally split about 30 percent each i'd like to spend more time on project work less time on the other stuff because I, I, I kind of struggle with that much more productive when I'm in the zone doing project work that's why I, I did architecture I didn't do architecture to do accounting and it would be nice to spend more time doing project work if I can have some clear time outside of the office then the project work is a lot more effective and productive when you come back you know, the, the, the directions can be clear, the decisions can be clear, conversations can be clear. That's how I find we move forward with ease. If you can make clear direction or clear decisions because of clear thinking. What are you doing mostly about being an architect? You know, the nice romantic one is, is dealing with people, but that can be as good as it can be a pain in the ass. That can be fantastic and it can drive you nuts. So, but I think in the whole, uh, dealing with people is, is really rewarding. But I think nothing beats the ability to see something for those years and years and years of effort. To see a product, to have something that you can touch and experience and look at and see and other people touch and look at and experience and all of that is, uh, is by far the most rewarding. But then again, that can be really uh, depressing too because you think about it and think, oh, what a missed opportunity that was or if only we'd have done this or if only we'd have done that. Again, it's like music. If you don't finish it and you don't get it done so you can stand back or and listen to it or look at it or experience it and critique it, you're never going to develop. You don't really learn from your successes, but you learn from your mistakes. Maybe you do. Maybe you learn what, you learn what works well, but I think you learn quicker by learning what not to do. If you've got a, a project and you know there's a few dodgy bits in it, you say, well, I'm not going to do that again. That didn't look good, but at least you've tried it. It may not have worked or there's you could make it work better. That kind of contributes to the constant learning 
of the of the job which is also another real benefit you you never stop learning in fact the more you do it i think the more you learn the more they realize you don't know yeah and you start learning different things outside of architecture you start learning about psychology and people's personalities and their decision making processes and and you start learning about politics and how decisions are made in government or how they're made in large corporations you start to understand why people behave the way they do you just never stop learning man it's just it's just constant and it's really really rewarding because of that yeah so then on the flip side would you have the same things <laughs> exactly the same things sometimes you have relationships with people that are fantastic sometimes you have relationships with people that you just want to nut them but that's the way it is yeah. you know that's the way it is I mean they're few and far between but they can be the difference between a really good project and a really bad project experience and similarly with your with your work you can do something that really works well it's really cool you love it and you're really happy with it and then you can have the flip side and that's really quite depressing at times you know when that happens and anyone that says that they've never had that is lying you, you know yeah they're not being truthful and or they're not being critical enough of their work and that can be really quite challenging and, and depressing yeah say 10 years architecture is the dream job I absolutely love it and one architecture is living hell how would you rank what you do every day on a scale of 1 to 10 ah oh, look there's plenty of jobs that I would like to do um, that would be a 10 mm. you know professional surfer professional <laughs> Sock player, you know, any of those things. But realistically, if you're going to work, if you don't have a trust fund and, and so on, and, and you have to work, I think that architecture is a good profession. But I think you've got to be the right person. I, I, on a scale of 1 to 10, I, I can't really see myself doing anything else. I think if I'd have hated it, I would have got out of it a long time ago. So maybe an 8 or a 9 for me. But uh, it's a really personal thing. You have to be the right type of person. Just because it's an eight or a nine for me, it could be completely different for someone else. And it is. You, you know, some people get into it they, and they, they f get frustrated about it. You know, they feel that they're, they're not able or the compromises and the, and the politics become too much and they end up doing something else. And, and good luck to them because at least they've, they've worked out almost um, almost by default what they want to do and it's not architecture so yeah it, it's it's real it's a, it's a real hard one I think for for others to give advice and say yeah you should be an architect you should get into it because I really enjoy it I suppose that's the purpose of this video right is to is to give some insight into into what it's like yeah I'd say an eight or a nine for me mm. one day some days it's a one. <laughs> yeah, it does. But if you could go back 27 years to when you first actually were living before then, if you could go back to when you first started, say, architecture school, would you have any advice or suggestions for your younger self? Um, is there anything you would do differently? Or? Yeah, I do. I would. I wouldn't be too concerned about stylistically the influences of your lecturers I mean I really started enjoying architecture in third year when I broke away from that I see a lot of students do this architecture was an absolute you know so you in order to study architecture you had to do it like this so it's like school you know in order to do maths you got to learn this and you got to do it like this you got to do it this way because that's maths or physics or chemistry or any of those it's architecture is not a science design in architecture is very much an art as soon as you can find your thing in like in any art don't don't worry about what anyone else says if it contradicts what you believe in your heart or your gut 
is right, then ignore them. You've got to follow your own path. You've got, to, you, you've got to run to the beat of your own drum, not someone else's. Don't copy someone else's work because at that point in time it happens to be in all the magazines. If your tutor is saying, saying to you, I think you should do it, this way because that's what all the famous architects are doing at this time sure go and have a look at it but if it doesn't resonate with what you want to do then disregard it you, you know go and source something else go and source other forms of of inspiration or ideas i only learnt that a bit later on in my education so you should see some of my first and second year work it's just man that, how did you go from second year doing that to third year doing that it's two different two two completely different people yeah, so it's just a way of thinking and having the confidence to be able to follow what I thought was was the way I wanted to to design and think, not somebody else's way. Yeah, does that make sense? Sorry, that's a bit of a waffly waffly answer. There'd be a few other things too. Don't fuck around. Just use the time at university to gather as and soak up as much information as you can because it's a really precious period. It's really the only time that you're going to have through your whole life where you can indulge yourself in the purity of architecture without having to worry about structures and clients and budgets and politics and other people's opinion, critics, yada, 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 yada. It's just you enjoy it immerse yourself in it because it's not going to happen again and um, you're going to get more out of it if you do much much more there's no point in doing it if you're not going to do that that's that's maybe my other advice for myself 23 or 25 years ago actually no it's 30 years ago yeah yeah how bloody cool was that? If you haven't checked out the full length film Behind Closed Doors, The Life of an Architect, you've got to set some time aside for that because it's pretty incredible what some of these guys have to share with you, some information and resources that will be really helpful if you're thinking about studying architecture or you just want to get an insight into the profession. So if you want to check that out, you can click that button to the side here or if you just want to go on with the next interview, check, that, check out that button to the side there. Catch you there.